Hey guys, in this video we're going to go through global challenges in biology for your OCR gateway. Now to go with this, to check off, so make sure you've covered everything, you know everything in depth and you know how to fill in any areas you've identified, there is a free version guide which you can download from my website. If you want to investigate what grows in a field, you can use a quadrat, which is going to be, um, let's say, a metre square. You throw that on the ground and count what is in there. Randomly moving it around the field so that you get a wide coverage. You're going to need to estimate the size of the field so that you can work out how much um, area there is. Work out your plant population per area that you've measured and then multiply that up to cover the entire field. A transect is a bit more ordered, you start at a point, take a line and then take measurements at every single point along that line. Um, this could be say from a hedge moving away so that you are varying things like light intensity or distance from water. Large parts of the world are suffering from deforestation at the moment where the trees are being cut down, either for logging so the trees, the wood can be used also that the land can be used to grow things like crops. The problem with deforestation is that it destroys habitats for the plants and animals, and if this is happening in a rainforest where there are lots of rare animals or animals that have yet to be discovered, then these animals are losing their habitats, so they can't be protected. It leads to soil erosion, so the soil that was held together by the um, roots isn't held together anymore, so when it rains, that just washes away, and there's a loss of nutrients. Peat is basically mud. It, it's complicated fancy mud, but it's basically mud. And this can be used for burning. And what they do is they chop it out of the ground in square chunks. It needs to be left in the sun to dry. And then it can be used as a fuel. The problem with chopping this out of the ground to use as a fuel is that it has taken millions of years for this to grow. So it's a non-renewable resource. And it provides a fantastic habitat for plants and animals. And once it is chopped up and burnt, that habitat is lost. There are a number of gases that contribute to global warming. We have carbon dioxide, water, and methane being the main ones. And global warming might be a slightly confusing term because not everywhere is getting hotter. Some places are getting colder, some places are getting drier, some places are getting windier. This is climate change going on. So while Australia may be having its hottest Christmas ever, we could be having our coldest Christmas ever here in the UK. And this is all due to global warming or climate change. This is going to have a massive impact on animals, predominantly on their habitat and their food sources. Polar bears live on ice caps, they hunt, they fish, and then they need to go and rest on floating blocks of ice. If the poles are getting warmer and the ice isn't there, then it's going to melt. Polar bears, after a long time fishing, won't have anywhere to rest and are at significant risk of drowning. Habitats are also spreading. For example, as the top of a mountain warms up, mosquitoes can move further up the mountain. Changing the location of where plants can grow, where animals can live. If a region is too hot or too cold, food may not grow there anymore, the plants or the animals that another animal survives on. Which is going to leave a species vulnerable if their food source has been wiped out. Biodiversity is the range of plants and animals that live within a habitat. And humans have a massive impact on biodiversity, whether it is chopping down loads of natural fields so that we can plant the same type of crop over and over again, reducing the biodiversity in that environment because we're replacing it with the same type of crop, or whether we are chopping down fields, forests, so that we can replace it with cities. There are a wide range of different types of pollution, whether it's air pollution from smog, water pollution where oil or rubbish is getting into the water, um, or plastic pollution where we're just leaving rubbish all over the place. And this could have a dramatic impact on the plants and animals that live there. If we're changing the chemistry of the water that they're living in, if we're pumping in nitrates from fertiliser, or if we're pumping in too much oil, the fish and the plants are going to struggle to survive. With plastic, these are being eaten by animals and the chemicals in there are moving up the food chain. 
And air pollution is having a massive effect on the animals, not just uh, the breathing, but whether they can their ability to camouflage. Food security is how sure that we are going to have food on our table. So how are we sure we are that our supermarkets are going to be full of things for us to buy? If as a country we don't produce much of our own food, we have to buy it in from other places. Which means we depend on other countries, other people's climates, trade agreements with these other countries and transport arrangements, getting the food across borders. Increasing our own food production in this country will ensure our food or help to ensure our food security. If we are producing our own food, we're not reliant on other people. We need to take into account ways to increase yields, for example, using fertiliser, but then we also need to take into account the impact that will have on the wider environment. And we need to take into account production methods. Are they land intensive? Are they good for the environment or not? As we are on islands, sustainable fishing is one way we can help to secure our food security. But we need to take into account things like net size. Are we catching fish before they are too old, before they've had a chance to reproduce? Are we catching too many? Do we maybe need to move to lion court fish so we don't catch endangered species? And we need to look at fisheries quotas. We can also look at new ways of developing food, for example, culturing microorganisms, which we can use as a food source. I think we can take a second to appreciate how adorably cute these little guys are before we start to talk about the serious issue of selective breeding. Selective breeding is breeding an animal for a particular characteristic. It happens with dogs, it happens with cows, with horses, with cats, with chickens, any animals that we keep and we're looking for a particular characteristic have probably undergone selective breeding. And the advantages this are is that you get animals which have the desired characteristic. Whether it's the very flat face of a pug, or horses that run fast, or cows that produce a lot of milk. It is important commercially that dairy farmers have cows that produce a lot of milk, that dog breeders have dogs that look cute. However, the disadvantages to this is if you have a healthy animal who doesn't display the desired characteristics... For dairy farmers, they are looking for cows that produce a lot of milk. These are obviously going to be female cows. So any male calves that are born, they are healthy animals, but they are not showing the desired characteristic, so they're killed. Um, dogs that don't show the desired characteristic can be put to sleep, even though they are perfectly healthy animals. Thousands of dogs, cats each year are killed just because they are not cute enough or do not look like the industry standard. The desired characteristic can lead to long-term health problems for the animals. I've chosen the pug as the example here. Because of the large number of folds on their face, it squashes their little nose and it gives them long-term breathing problems. Dogs like Labradors um, are very susceptible to things like arthritis. And dogs like Rhodesian Ridgebacks, the desired characteristic is a mutation. So any dogs that are born without the Ridgeback can be put to sleep. And then lastly, we have a lack of genetic diversity within the population. So when we're talking about breeding, this can lead to a lot of inbreeding where um, brothers and sisters are bred to get the desired characteristic, which is going to lead to um, recessive bad mutations coming out more often in the population. It also means they're going to be more susceptible to any diseases that are going to be around because they don't have the genetic immunity. We can genetically modify plant DNA, so we can take a DNA with our required characteristic, whether that is a drought resistance gene, so that countries that don't get much rain and very, very susceptible to droughts can survive that better, so that our crops are going to grow better. Whether that's um, a gene which um, produces a vitamin, so that countries that um, don't have a good food security, where food is shortage, where people are dying because they're not getting the right amount of vitamins, we can engineer the food, the rice that they're growing so that it produces more vitamins, so it's healthier, so that less people are going to die. Or whether it's just pesticide resistance, or the ability to resist being eaten by um, pests, being eaten by bugs so that yields are higher. We can take that gene and put it into our original plant DNA, producing a genetically modified plant. 
we can add in the new gene to the plant DNA, we can produce seeds and then the farmers can grow those seeds and the plants will have this new desired characteristic. Some people don't like genetically modified um, plants because they think it's interfering with nature. Genetic engineering has brought around some fantastic advances. One of the most useful of this is the way we produce insulin these days. Previously, insulin used to be harvested from pig cells and that's what people had to inject. It wasn't very um, uh, good and it wasn't very efficient. These days, we've taken the gene for insulin, we've taken a bit of bacterial DNA um, with the original DNA has our desired characteristic and bacterial DNA reproduces really quickly. The insertion of the gene for insulin into the bacterial DNA means that the bacteria are now producing insulin. So we are now producing large amounts of human insulin, which is a really important point, quickly and safely. This is much, much better for people than having to inject pig insulin. It's made things much cheaper, much faster and much safer. There is a number of different ways that cloning can take place. We can do it with a plant where we just chop a little bit off. Pop that into something like rooting hormone, put it into the soil, put it into the new pot and it will grow into a new plant. This works really well with things like lavender or strawberries. We can do it by tissue culture where we can let one cell divide. Then we can take that, put it into further petri dishes until we have lots of dishes of the same. Health is a complicated concept. It is going to be your overall state of physical and mental well-being. This is going to be affected by a number of things. It is going to be affected by your diet, exercise, community, whether you feel lonely, whether you have friends, and in part by your genes. A pathogen is a microorganism that causes disease. For example, we can have viruses, bacteria, fungi, or protists. And these can be spread in a number of different ways. They can be spread in the air, for example, by coughing. They can be spread by touch, uh, for example, if you have bacteria on your hands or you have bacteria or virus on your hands and you touch a table and someone else then touches that same table. They can be spread through blood, uh, sexual fluids, Or they can be transferred via a vector, like via a mosquito. Bacteria are going to make you feel ill because they produce a lot of toxins, so they'll give you things like food poisoning. Viruses will make you feel ill because when they reproduce, they cause massive cell death. HIV is a virus. It can be spread in a number of ways, that is unprotected sex. Um, sharing needles, childbirth, that's from mother to child, not just general childbirth, um, infected blood, um, breastfeeding from an infected mother. The implications are devastating for someone, although um, outcomes have rapidly improved recently due to the development of new drugs. So HIV attacks the white blood cells. White blood cells are an important part of your immune response. 
So if your white blood cells are being attacked, then you have little immune response. The damage is widespread and HIV can develop into AIDS where um, you is, that's acquired immune deficiency response which can lead to even the smallest infection having devastating consequences because you have no immunity against it. Tobacco mosaic virus is unsurprisingly a virus. It is spread from plant to plant by direct contact. The implications are a reduced level of chlorophyll. Which is why you can see the um, mosaic pattern on the leaves. Some areas have a different um, level of chlorophyll than others. Now if they have reduced chlorophyll, that's going to be reduced photosynthesis, which is going to lead to reduced sugars. Meaning that there's going to be a lower yield... from the plants, whether that's tobacco plants, this also affects tomato plants. So it's going to affect the commercial side of a business. Salmonella is caused by a bacteria. It's spread by eating infected foods. It lives in the gut of farm animals, so infected foods are going to be like things like um, eggs, meat, milk or poultry. However, it's very, very rare in the UK. We have eggs that have a little lion mark on them, which means they are salmonella-free. And I don't think there's been a case of salmonella poisoning from eggs in years. The implications are going to be diarrhoea, stomach cramps, vomiting and fever. Not very pleasant at all. And if severe dehydration sets in, then it can be life-threatening. Malaria is a parasite. It is spread by female mosquitoes. Drinking your blood at night. It's not quite as sexy as Twilight made it out to be. The implications are going to be a high fever. Sweats and also chills, headache, vomiting, uh, chest and muscle pains, and diarrhea. And this can be lethal in severe cases. Gonorrhea is a bacteria which has a very long complicated name. It is spread via contact with penile or vaginal fluid. It can also be passed to a mo from a mother to a newborn baby. The implications are a thick green smelly discharge from the penis or vagina thoroughly unpleasant pain and urinating and bleeding While the um, symptoms are thoroughly unpleasant, about 1 in 10 infected men and around half of the infected women won't actually show any symptoms. Because the symptoms are so unpleasant, and because quite a large number of people don't actually show any symptoms, it is very, very important that you always wear a condom. Apart from being smelly and off-putting, uh, the main damage here is going to be to your reputation, apart from if you're a newborn baby, when it can lead to blindness. Plant diseases can be identified in a number of different ways. This could be due to discoloration of the leaves. So here we have the tobacco mosaic virus. 
where you can see the leaves going coloured or um, they could be a black colour developing as in rose black spots. The leaves could fall off. Um, it could have a loss of vigour, which basically means it falls over and looks a bit pathetic. Um, the flowers um, could either develop wrong or they could not develop at all, or it could die. However, a poorly looking plant doesn't necessarily have a disease, it might have an iron deficiency. If it has low nitrates, it is going to have poor growth, plus yellow leaves. If there are low phosphates, it is going to have poor root growth, plus discoloured leaves. Low potassium is going to lead to poor flower and fruit growth. And low magnesium is going to be yellow leaves. This crossover into chemistry. This is why your NPK fertilisers are important. You may have seen plants in the summer covered with thousands, millions of tiny little black or green aphids. Devouring the plant as they go. They will go, they will suck all of the, the water, all the nutrients, all of the ions out of the plant, effectively killing it. However, the good news is that ladybirds and ants love to eat aphids, so this is a way that we can have natural pest control. You can go on the internet and you can order a box of ladybirds and you can use these to control the aphids in your garden. The body is rather good at protecting itself against pathogens. The stomach is full of acid which kills bacteria. Your respiratory system, your nose, your trachea, your bronchi are full of mucus and hairs which trap bacteria. Your skin acts as a barrier which stops things getting in. And your eyes have tears which wash them out clean. Your immune system is brilliantly clever at protecting you. It consumes pathogens, so your white blood cells will engulf, they will eat anything that they see as unfamiliar and dangerous, and then it will destroy it. They produce antitoxins to counteract the toxins that the bacteria produce. And they produce antibodies so that they can recognise um, pathogens faster. Here we have our lovely little mouse who's going to be vaccinated and this is what's going to start the formation of antibodies. After a while... Cells from the spleen of the mouse, where the antibodies are formed, are collected. We can take a known cell line, a cancerous cell line, myeloma cells, and we can fuse them together. After the antibodies and the cancer cell line have been fused together, we end up with a hybrid cell. These hybrid cells can be grown in culture in a laboratory until we have lots and lots of them. After they've grown up, the cells can be taken and the cells and the antibodies can be separated. The antibodies can then be used for various different things like pregnancy tests or cancer detection. I imagine most of you have been vaccinated, or if you haven't, at least you've heard about vaccinations. Vaccinations are given generally to children or people that have gone on holiday to different places. And the Childhood Vaccination Programme in the UK has prevented millions and millions of deaths and further millions and millions of serious illnesses. 
and in this country it has wiped out a large number of debilitating diseases. It is very rare to have anyone getting polio these days in the UK because we are all vaccinated against it at a young age. The polio vaccine isn't too bad because they give it to you on a sugar cube, but it is quite painful taking your eight-week-old baby to be injected by the nurse. A vaccination is going to contain small amounts of dead or inactive pathogens. This allows your immune system to develop antibodies. So if you get infected with the disease at a later point, your body already has antibodies to it, it can recognise it, it knows its pathogen, it knows how to deal with and it can be dealt with quickly before you get ill. The advantages are that a large number of diseases have been wiped out, for example, nobody gets smallpox anymore, or polio. And we have herd immunity, which means if a large percentage of the population are vaccinated against a disease, even the small percentage that have decided to not be vaccinated or can't be vaccinated for medical reasons are going to be protected as well because the disease will find it very hard to spread. The disadvantages is that they don't always work. The polio um, vaccines, smallpox vaccines, are very, very efficient, but things like the flu vaccine doesn't always work. And it can be painful, and there can be side effects. You may have heard about um, a controversy where somebody linked the MMR vaccine and autism. This is completely untrue. There is absolutely no link between these two. If you want to produce an uncontaminated culture of bacteria, moving your bacteria from one place to another, you first need to flame your inoculation loop so that it is red hot. This makes sure it kills everything that is on there. You need to make sure that you open your bottles near the flame so that no further contamination can get in there. Open the lid as little as possible, flaming the lid as you go. Work as quickly as possible to transfer the sample of bacteria that you've picked up into your uncontaminated broth. I'm working as quickly as possible so that you don't get any other bacterial contamination. You can then leave the sample at um, 37 degrees if you've got an incubator or just leave it on the bench at 25 degrees. Um, for a few days and your bacteria will grow. I've done a much longer video explaining this as you can see in set here if you want to go and have a look at that it's in the playlist with all of the other required practicals. Bacteria divide very very quickly from 1 into 2 into 4 into 8 into 16. A good bacteria, a happy bacteria, a bacteria that's got lots of nutrients and is happy with what it's doing will divide roughly every 20 minutes. So that very, very quickly, you'll go from one bacteria to millions of bacteria. So that you can become very ill from um, ingesting, from getting in the cuts, from getting your skin, just a single bacteria, because they divide very, very rapidly. When we are going to be looking at the effect of antibiotics or antiseptics on how bacteria grow, we need to make sure that our work area and our hands are clean. Because even though these um, bacteria are relatively safe to use, we have to assume they're going to be pathogenic. You need to make sure you've labelled the underside, not the lid, of the agar plate. And these plates will probably already be seeded for you by the technician. You can put your little filter paper discs on there, use forceps to do this, and then incubate them at 25 degrees for 48 hours. We can, then me we can then measure the clear zones in two different directions. Here the clear zone is slightly hard to see, but hopefully if you look close enough you can see it. It's better if you measure the diameter, but in this case the only thing that I could do was to measure the radius because the clear zone was so large. New drugs need to be tested for new things. Toxicity, 
efficacy and dose. Toxicity tells us the level or the amount of the drug that we can take before the side effects are too bad. All the drugs that we take on a daily basis have side effects, but since we know how toxic they are, we know which safe or reasonable level we can take them at without suffering too badly from the side effects. Efficacy is like how efficient it is. You can see the similarities in the two words. Does it work better or worse than what's already on the market? Are the side effects better or worse than what's already on the market? Is it worth developing or taking this drug? And dose. How much do you need to take for the drug to be effective? Penicillin has saved millions and millions of life. It's potentially saved your life and you probably haven't even realised. When um, Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin in uh, 1928, it really was revolutionary because before that, people were dying of things that now we take for granted. If you've ever been in hospital and had an operation, you've probably been given antibiotics afterwards to stop you getting an infection. Or if you've ever had tonsillitis, you've probably been given penicillin. And it cleared up any infection without many complications. But before we had penicillin, people died of operations, people died of common things all the time. But this was an accidental discovery. He went away, left his bacterial plates and some of them went mouldy. And he noticed that the bacteria didn't grow all the way up to the mould. Something in the mould was stopping the growth of the bacteria. And this is when we realised it was penicillin and that penicillin could stop bacterial growth. These beautiful, beautiful flowers are foxgloves, but they are highly, highly toxic. Because from these flowers we get digitalis, which is a heart drug. Saved millions of lives, but the flowers have probably killed hundreds of children. And the discovery of aspirin is down to a traditional ancient medicine. It's been known for ages that people used to chew on willows, willow bark, when they had a headache. When they had a toothache, when they weren't feeling very well. So the willow, the willow bark was taken, it was distilled and it was discovered that it had aspirin in it. And that's how we got our major painkiller. As part of a lifestyle, some people may choose to drink alcohol or to smoke. However, if you drink alcohol, you are susceptible to liver damage. You're at increased risk of some cancers. Alcohol has a lot of calories in it, so you are at risk of being overweight. Smoking can lead to lung damage. And cancer. When we have cardiovascular disease, we have fatty deposits. building up in the coronary arteries, the arteries around the heart. This can lead to the formation of blood clots. This blood clot can block an artery. This is going to restrict the oxygen. To some cells. These cells are then going to die. If too many cells die, this can then lead to a heart attack. If so many cells die that the heart can't function properly or can't pump blood properly. Risk factors for this are going to be smoking, high blood pressure, or having too much salt or fat in your diet. Cancer is when cells begin to divide uncontrollably.
this is going to lead to lumps, which for most people, some people, is the first sign that something is wrong. And these lumps can be divided into two groups, benign tumours and malignant tumours. Benign tumours are slow and are generally harmless. Things like warts or moles are benign tumours. And having a lump on your skin generally doesn't do you much damage. The problem is when they are malignant tumours. These are fast growing, they are aggressive and they are mobile. So I don't mean the wart on your arm or the mole on your arm is going to get up and start moving around. I mean cells are going to move throughout your body. Cells from the initial lump are going to jump into the bloodstream, move somewhere else and they could set up tumours, lumps in other places. And while a lump on your skin generally won't do you much damage, a lump in your brain, a lump in your liver or a lump in your lungs can do you quite a lot of damage. There are a lot of risk factors involved in cancer and there are a lot of things that we're in control of. Smoking has large implications in lung cancer. Diet, a good diet, can reduce your risk of bowel cancer, whereas if you don't eat much fruit and vegetables, then you are putting your bowel um, at risk of cancer. The amount of time you spend in the sun can affect your susceptibility to skin cancer. And unprotected sex can leave you at risk of cervical cancer. The aim of the Human Genome Project was to determine the sequence of base pairs in a human genome. That's a lot of work because there's roughly 3 billion pairs. They wanted to find all the genes and they wanted to develop faster ways of sequencing in the future. The first time it was done, it took an incredibly long time and cost a large amount of money and it was finished in 2001. But they did a really good job of finding faster ways to sequence in the future. It is now not as big a job. It's still quite a lot of work, but it costs roughly £500 to get someone's genome sequenced. And this is paving the way for large advances, very fast advances in personalised medicine. So that if you develop something awful like cancer or another genetic disease, they can tailor the treatment that they give you exactly to what your genome needs. Ouch! This is why in some videos I have unexplained scratches. 